everybody for coming to Grand Rounds. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Bessie Young. Uh, Dr. Young started her educational journey here at the UW, where she got her medical degree, and then uh, stayed for residency and made the wise lifestyle but poor financial decision of being a chief resident for a year here at the University Hospital. She then did her nephrology fellowship here, and then followed that up with a general internal medicine fellowship combined with an MPH degree. She currently serves on the editorial board of multiple journals, community advisory boards, and the Dean's Committee on Minority Affairs. She also is currently or has been the PI on multiple uh, grant-funded research projects, uh, primarily concerning chronic kidney disease, home dialysis, and the intersection of racial determinants of kidney health. Um, she has been honored multiple times for her dedication to service, including uh, the National Association of Minority Medical Educators, and in 2013 was Seattle's Top Doc Community Service Award winner. Uh, on a more personal note, I know Dr. Young from her clinical work at our Veterans Hospital, where she is universally beloved by the house staff and one of our favorite people to ask when we have a problem with somebody's kidneys. Uh, thank you very much for coming, Dr. Young, and please come and tell us about it. Thanks, Cameron, and thank you for inviting me for uh, this talk. I'm very honored to be here. Um, so um, I'm going to start with a case, and this is, it's not my own case, but it's a case from the literature, but it sort of starts uh, the process here for what I'd like to talk about. And my talk is going to be more of a work in progress, so um, there's a lot of new data that I'll be presenting, um, and so um, I'd like to start uh, here. So here's a case of a 21-year-old Afro-Caribbean male who, with a history of end-stage renal disease of unknown origin. He presented to a, a clinic um, actually in France um, where he had a creatinine of 8.4. He had a family history of two relatives who had kidney disease and were on dialysis. Um, at the clinic presentation, he had a blood pressure of 170 over 85. His estimated GFR um, creatinine clearance is, was about 10 mils per minute per meter squared. He did not have diabetes. His hemoglobin A1C was 6, and he was filling 3.5 grams of protein at that time. His HIV, ANA, and all other tests were negative, and he underwent a living-related donor transplant from his twin brother. And so this uh, defines what his clinical course was. At about, at about a, um, a year, he had about a gram of protein in his urine. At about 30 months, he developed um, frank proteinuria. His eGFR declined to about 43, and he had a kidney biopsy at that time that showed focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, or FSGS. Um, his brother, who was his donor, also developed a decrease in his creat uh, increased creatinine and a decrease in his estimated GFR, and also developed proteinuria. So um, this is uh, what his biopsy showed. This isn't the actual biopsy, but um, this is uh, biopsy of uh, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. And what you can see here is a normal glomerulus with very nice um, capillary loops. And this area here is so the biopsy of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. So this is the glomerulus. These are the tubules. And this is an area of scar. Um, and it's this uh, scar that occurs segmental, segmentally in the glomerulus um, and in a focal area in the biopsy. Um, so he um, was also evaluated for a new uh, genetic polymorphism called apolipoprotein-1 um, polymorphism and was found to have two abnormalities in the G1 and G2 area. And I'm going to come back to this during the talk and talk uh, more about these. So he actually developed end-stage renal disease and went on to dialysis. Um, so um, this leads into the objectives of my talk, which are really to describe the epidemiology of health disparities in kidney disease for African Americans to review some of the tradi traditional risk factors for kidney disease that we all know, talk about some of the new genetic findings for kidney disease in African Americans, such as able L1 uh, polymorphisms and sickle cell trait, and then to discuss the ex ethical issues in genetics and kidney disease and end with some conclusions. And hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. So as a little bit of background, um, everyone knows that chronic kid kidney disease affects about 26 million Americans um, in the US. African Americans have a faster progression of chronic kidney disease once they actually have it, and they have a three to four fold greater incidence of end stage renal disease um, compared to whites. Um, African Americans comprise about 12% of the population, but a, roughly a third of dialysis patients. So 
We know and we've known for the past probably 20 to 25 years that African Americans have a higher incidence and progression of kidney disease. Um, this is a graph from the United States Renal Data System, which is the national registry uh, for end-stage renal disease. And what it shows is that African Americans, dating back to the 80s, have had a higher incidence of end-stage renal disease when you compare it to whites who are featured in the blue line. African Americans are sort of the yellow-orange line. And now, currently, African Americans probably have the highest incidence rate of end-stage renal disease in the world. So. Um, and, it, and that incidence rate is actually plateauing and starting to decrease, but it's still much higher than any of the other groups um, here in the United States. So the determinants of health um, are something that the, the CDC focuses on, and the determinants of health um, are thought to, to combine to affect health in general for the individual. So I'm going to use this, the determinants of health um, all through my talk to talk about the risk factors for chronic kidney disease. And determinants of health are defined as the range of personal, social, economic, and environmental factors that influence health status. Um, and as a goal for Healthy People 2020, the CDC um, has this goal to reduce new cases of chronic kidney disease and its complications, disability, death, and economic costs. Um, so we'll talk about how the determinants of health affect kidney disease in African American African Americans and start with what are the social determinants of health. So social determinants of health are things like neighborhood um, and the built environment, whether or not the neighborhood is safe or segregated, access to health and um, health care, um, the social and community um, environment, education and economic stability or the level of poverty. And, and we'll, I'll show you some data that some of these things can affect whether or not someone has prevalent uh, chronic kidney disease, particularly for African Americans. Um, the determinants of health, though, um, include things like policy making at the local, federal, and state level, social factors like, uh, again, sort of your culture, um, health services, and access to care, um, individual behavior like whether or not someone smokes or if they drink alcohol, whether or not they exercise and what their diet is. And then there's the biology of, of genetics or, or things like sickle cell disease, which we know is a genetic trait, or polycystic uh, kidney disease, which are genetic uh, abnormalities that can affect kidney disease. So we'll start with policy making and um, sort of ask the question, can policy, social policy improve health? Um, so this is a graph of the deaths per million um, and uh, excuse me, motor vehicle <laughs> um, accidents. So these are deaths, um, and these are the vehicle miles traveled. So can anyone, does anyone know what this graph represents? It has nothing to do with kidneys, but <laughs> it's a good introduction to can policy improve health. Um, so this graph runs from 1925 to 1995, and, and this is basically when cars were started. Um, this is sort of the intersection of when there were laws passed in the United States that improved um, the safety of cars and seat belts were imp implemented basically at this point. So you can see that um, there were a number of deaths um, prior to 1965 or 1966, and after that, the deaths decrease um, as our ve vehicular miles increase. So this is just an example of, what, of how policy can really improve health and decrease the number of deaths. Um, so what about kidney disease? So if you look at um, policies in the, in the world of um, end-stage renal disease, we have the end-stage renal disease program, and that was a program that was developed in 1972, and it was supposed to allow access to dialysis for, for everyone in the United States. And so now, if anyone starts dialysis, they actually can, can go on dialysis and not need to worry about paying for it. It was also supposed to increase access to transplantation. So what this graph shows, again, from the United States Renal Data System is that for African Americans, they are sort of at the bottom here, um, along with Native Americans, and, and have decreased access to transplantation. There are a lot of factors that are involved with that, you know, such as um, sort of genetics and education and just access to sort of a pre-transplant workup. Um, but there's been other research that's been done by Yoshio Hall, who is here, one of our um, uh, faculty members that shows that even after you adjust for all the things that we think contribute, African Americans here um, are less likely to be waitlisted for transplant, um, as well as American Indians, as, and African Americans are less likely to be transplanted. So I think in this regard, uh, this sort of um, policy hasn't really worked equally for 
all the people who are affected with end-stage renal disease. So let's move on to social factors. Um, and social factors um, include such things as poverty, um, neighborhood segregation, food insecurity. So um, in terms of social factors in kidney disease, we know that poverty is associated with um, increased prevalence of chronic kidney disease. There's some data from Deidre Cruz um, where she shows that um, African Americans have a 1.9 fold greater risk of increased prevalence of chronic kidney disease um, compared to whites uh, who live in a similar neighborhood. Um, we also know that neighborhood segregation can actually lead to isolation of uh, people, especially with regards to kidney disease. So Rudy Rodriguez and Anne O'Hare showed in a paper in the Annals in 2007 that um, neighborhood segregation was associated with less access to home hemodialysis therapies, such as peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis, worse survival in those dialysis units that were in those segregated neighborhoods, and more for-profit dialysis units, which we think um, may not be as good as, as the non-profit units. Um, and, and finally, in terms of food security, there's a high food security um, insecurity associated, high food insecurity was associated with a 1.37 fold greater prevalence of chronic kidney disease for basically all, um, all comers and African Americans have a, a stronger sort of propensity for that. Um, so if we move to health services, um, We'll start with some of the traditional risk factors for chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. So diabetes, um, as it's been shown that African Americans are more likely to have diabetes, they're more likely to have poor control, and if you look in places where there is comfortable access to care, um, they're uh, less likely to have these things controlled, like their blood pressure and their hemoglobin A1C and their, um, um, and their kidney disease um, component. And for hypertension, African Americans have a greater level of hypertension and poor control than whites. And lack of, ac lack of access to care has been known to decrease um, access to prevention of some of these risk factors um, and leads to an increase in the risk of chronic kidney disease. So we'll go through some of these um, sort of factors. So um, back in 2005, we worked with folks at uh, Group Health where we looked at diabetic patients who um, had access to care. And what we found is that the diabetic minorities had greater odds of albuminuria, which is either microalbuminuria or macroalbuminuria. And um, African Americans had like a 2.6 fold greater risk of macroalbuminuria at baseline entry into the study. Asian Americans had a 2.24 greater risk of macroalbuminuria. And the Hispanic population had a 1.93 fold greater risk of microalbuminuria. And this is after adjustment for things like age and their diabetes type, hemoglobin A1C, and duration of their diabetes. So um, in, a, in the setting where we know that there's um, equivalent access to care, um, these groups have worse evidence of kidney disease. And I'll go over this trial, which was one of the first trials of, that enrolled African Americans in a, a randomized controlled trial. So this was the African American study of kidney disease and hypertension, or the ASK study. And it looked at the effects of ramipril versus amlodipine on renal outcomes and hypertensive nephrosclerosis. They recruited African Americans from 1995 to 1998. They included um, people who had um, chronic kidney disease, so their estimated GFR was 20 to 65. They included, recruited over 1,000 people, and they looked at uh, whether or not their blood pressure decreased cardiac events and progression of their end-stage renal disease um, when they were placed on either calcium channel blockers or ACE inhibitors. So um, prior to this, um, African Americans were really treated with calcium channel blockers because they were thought to have a low renin hypertension. And so this was one of the first studies that actually just specifically enrolled African Americans. And what this study showed was that if you looked at um, either a decrease in GFR, end-stage renal disease, or death, um, and lodipine was associated with a higher progression and higher event rate compared to ramipril. So um, this was one of the first studies that showed that ACE inhibitors actually prevented death, development of end-stage renal disease, and uh, progression of chronic kidney disease. When they just looked at end-stage renal disease or death and lodipine, um, was associated with increased risk of end-stage renal disease or death. So um, this study showed that ramipril or an ACE inhibitor was actually beneficial for African Americans. Um, and when they followed these uh, patients 
long term, so they followed them for 10 years, and they showed that even in the people who had well-controlled blood pressure, so blood pressures were controlled to about 133 over 75 or so, um, but there was still a 50, over a 50% progression of patients to the composite outcome of end-stage renal disease, progression of, cardio, progression of um, chronic kidney disease, or death. Um, so it showed that potentially there's something else involved in end-stage renal disease for African Americans. And um, so, so we'll move on now to individual behavior. And um, so, and this gets to work that we're doing with the Jackson Heart Study. Uh, so the Jackson Heart Study is one of the largest prospective NIH-funded study, studies of cardiovascular disease in African Americans. They enrolled uh, subjects from the ages of 21 to 94, and they enrolled about 5,300 African Americans from Jackson, Mississippi, um, and had three institutional partners, which in included the University of Mississippi, Jackson State University, and Tougaloo College. Um, they had three exams with data collected at each point um, for 10 to 12 years, and uh, we, did, we were lucky to receive an NIH R01 grant to develop a chronic kidney disease work, working group. So up until that point, uh, they had specifically been looking at um, outcomes such as coronary heart disease, stroke, and heart failure. And uh, they had three exams. Exam one was from 2000 to 2004. Exam two was 2005 to 2008. And exam three was 2009 to so basically the current time period. So we are now looking at end-stage renal disease and progression of kidney disease in this cohort um, from baseline to 2014. And one of the first things that we looked at are, were risk factors for rapid decline in African Americans. So we know that uh, chronic kidney disease is an important risk factor for cardiovascular disease in all comers. And the rate of kidney function decline has been associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, mortality, and hospitalization. And so we hypothesized that African Americans would actually have, um, there would be maybe a heterogeneity of rapid renal function decline and that would occur in a subset of, of patients um, or enrollees with known risk factors for chronic kidney disease. Um, and so looking at the Jackson Heart Study, we excluded people who um, had missing creatinine at baseline or missing creatinine at visit three. There were no creatinines at visit two. And all those patients who were on dialysis, and we included a subset of 3,653 subjects. Um, we looked at albuminuria and imputed albumin um, at baseline. Um, and just to give you an idea of what this cohort looks like, it's really a, a population-based general cohort. Uh, so the average age was about 54 to 55, and this was our analysis cohort. 37% um, were male, uh, about 12% had a low income, and 16% had lower than high school education. Um, a high, very high percentage had um, private insurance, and BMI was relatively high at 31.8. Uh, systolic blood pressure was 126 on average, and creatinine was within the normal range at 0.96. About 20% had diabetes, and about 60% had hypertension. Um, and the albumin to creatinine ratio was basically normal for the majority of the population here. Um, and so these analyses were done by Ronit Katz, who is one of the researchers at the Kidney Research Institute, so I want to thank her for these analyses. And what we found was that um, there was about a 12% 12 um, uh, 12 of, the patient, of the enrollees actually progressed um, and had rapid renal function decline, which was defined as greater than 30% decline over 10 years. Um, and if you looked at the categories of estimated GFR, so if someone had an, a normal eGFR, um, there was about a 10% decline in renal function. 10% of, of subjects had a rapid renal function decline. From an eGFR to from 60 to 89, it was about 12%. But if subjects had eGFR that was less than 60, they had probably a 30 to 35% um, rapid renal function decline. So not everybody declines equally. And if we look at, look at risk factors for rapid renal function decline, uh, just based on some of the traditional risk factors, we found that older people progress faster. So um, for every 10 year of increase in age, um, there was a, a roughly about a 1.8-fold um, rapid renal function decline. Income uh, is a variable that's important for rapid renal function decline, so there, this trend was positive. And if you look at education, um, those who had less than a high school education 
had about a two-fold risk of rapid renal function decline compared to those who had a college degree as the reference. If you looked at systolic blood pressure for every 17 millimeter increase, there was about a 1.3-fold uh, increase in rapid renal function decline. And current smokers had about a two-fold risk of rapid renal function decline. Diabetes um, had about a 1.5-fold risk. And um, if someone had um, albumin in their urine, if they doubled it, or if they had an ACR that was greater than 30, which is microalbuminuria, they had a threefold risk of rapid renal function decline. So this is not necessarily new, but these are risk factors um, that we, we know, but this is in a population that is just African American and, and just shows that not everybody progresses at the same rate. So we sort of conclude that chronic kidney disease is, is relatively prevalent um, and that the risk factors include those that we know such as age, diabetes, hypertension, and albuminuria. Um, some behavioral factors include smoking, um, which is known to affect kidney disease, but I think um, is something that we don't really focus on very much. And then additional risk factors such as BMI, which have been shown in other populations, or waist circumference, or obesity, um, were not found to be significant. Um, but there is a need to evaluate other potential risk factors. Um, and so some of these novel risk factors include things like periodontal disease. So Vanessa Grubb, who, Grubbs, who works at um, the uh, uh, UCSF um, down in San Francisco, looked at periodontal disease and found that those uh, African Americans who had severe periodontal disease had a fourfold greater incidence of chronic kidney disease in the Jackson Heart Study and the ERIC Study. Um, and so um, after adjusting for age, gender, diabetes, and smoking status. Uh, so this is a um, relatively novel risk factor that um, may have some implications for intervention. Um, and here at the Kidney Re Research Institute, um, Anisha Bonsell, who is interested in cardiovascular disease, looked at unadjusted incidence rates of cardiovascular events in people with um, chronic kidney disease and without chronic kidney disease in the Jackson Heart Study and showed that if you look at all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, incident heart failure, incident chronic kidney disease, or stroke, chronic kidney disease is a risk factor. So chronic kidney disease is a risk factor, and um, there are risk factors for chronic kidney disease. Um, so um, this sort of leaves us, um, we're going to move on to biology and genetics, um, which I'd like to focus in on a little bit more. So to start out with, um, we know that uh, there are differences in um, kidney disease between African Americans and, and whites. And this study was one of the first that showed that there was an association of an able lipoprotein genetic variant with kidney disease in African Americans. Uh, this occurred, uh, this paper was published in Science in 2010. And what it showed is that, um, I'm going to go back and, and talk a little bit more about this able lipoprotein L1. Um, so, Trypanosomes, which are endemic in Africa, are um, parasites that get transferred from the gut of the tsetse fly to the human by a bite. And these are the trypanosomes, and this, these are red blood cells. They basically have a coating that uh, allows them to um, not be attacked by our own immune system. They live inside the human body, and they multiply very rapidly. And when they cross the blood-brain bar barrier, they cause African sleeping sickness, which can be lethal and, and actually cause death. Um, and so these genetic variants were, have been associated. The apolipoprotein lipoprotein L1 is a variant that's been associated with protection from these trypanosomes. And these variants were thought to uh, have arisen about 3,600, 3,000 to 6,000 years ago in Africa. Um, and are, are associated with resistance to the lethal form of African sleeping sickness. Sick, sickness. So these variants are only present in people who have um, African descent. They're not found in European Americans, Japanese, um, um, or Chinese, or Native Americans. They're found in about 12% of Hispanic Americans with some African descent. Um, and that was uh, data that was from the Hispanic Dominicans and Puerto Ricans from New York City. Um, and so there are two variants that are associated with non-diabetic kidney disease. There's a G1 variant that has two amino acid substitutions. So there's a serine um, that uh, gets substituted uh, to a glycine. There's an isoleucine that gets uh, substituted for the methionine. And there's a G2 abnormality where you actually have two base pair deletions. So there's a, uh, a, a serogene and a tyrosine deletion. 
Um, and this G1 variant has been shown to be present in about 40% of the Yoruba tribe from Nigeria. Uh, when they evaluated the HapMap um, data where they have DNA from uh, Europeans, Japanese, and Chinese um, subjects. Um, and so what this means is that, or what people think has happened that 20,000 20, to 100,000 years ago, um, there was a migration out of Africa. Europeans have none of these polymorphisms. Europeans came to the United, uh, to the North American continent about, uh, you know, over the last 400 years or so. West Africans, who have 46% prevalence of these polymorphisms, uh, came to uh, North America and the Caribbean uh, through the slave trade, mainly over, you know, 400 years ago. And so when you look at African Americans, they have about a 36% prevalence of this, um, these polymorphisms. Um, African Americans have about 20% European genetic uh, makeup. And so when they looked at whether or not people had end-stage renal disease, um, the cases of African Americans, they had more uh, prevalent apolipoprotein L1 abnormalities or polymorphisms. So how do these variants come, cause panosome lysis? Uh, so this apolipoprotein L1, um, the wild type, is a protein that is part of the HDL um, lipo, lipoprotein. And this uh, apolipoprotein is thought to insert itself into the lysosomes, and then it just allows fluid to go into these lysosomes, and basically the protos the, these uh, trypanosomes burst, they lyse. Um, the trypanosomes, though, have a factor called the serum resistance associated protein, which can bind to this apolipoprotein um, L1 uh, wild type, and it prevents the lysosome from swelling, and the parasite survives. And what these uh, polymorphisms are thought to do is that they actually block this SRA, and so the lysosome um, is now affected by this apolipoprotein. And, can, and is lice, basically. So um, subjects or people who have this apolipoprotein uh, phenotype in Africa actually have um, the ability to, they are protected from trypanosome infection. And so uh, the study by Pollock showed that if you looked at cases of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, which is a disease that causes nephrotic syndrome in, Africa, in, in anyone who has it, and can be associated with end-stage renal disease. Uh, they found that if you had this apolipoprotein L1 variant, you had a 10.5-fold greater risk of end-stage renal disease. Um, and so they compared African Americans to African Americans who did not have this apolipoprotein variant, and then they compared them to whites. Uh, they also looked at the hypertensive end-stage renal disease and found that African Americans with the apolipoprotein L1 variant had a 7.3-fold greater risk of end-stage renal disease than African Americans without this variant. Um, and it, they also, people have looked at chronic uh, kidney disease and, and whether or not people progress um, in the chronic re renal insufficiency cohort or the CRIC cohort and the ASK study um, and the ERIC study, which showed that the risk of progression of chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease was greater in uh, subjects who had the apolipoprotein L1 abnormality. And in, in addition, transplanted kidneys from apolipoprotein L1 donors have more rejection. So we'll go over some of those data here. So this was recently published in the uh, New England Journal, Journal of Medicine in 2013. And this is a study where they looked at apolipoprotein L1 uh, polymorphisms and the risk of end-stage renal disease and CKD progression in the CRIC study and the ASK study. So in Subjects who had only one of the variants or none of the variants, they had less progression or fewer endpoints compared to subjects that had uh, two of the genetic polymorphisms. Um, and if they looked according to proteinuria status, um, they found the same thing, that subjects with uh, proteinuria actually had a faster progression, uh, but there is still this uh, sort of dissociation between those subjects who had um, only zero to um, one of the apolipoprotein abnormalities, or they had uh, two of the apolipoprotein abnormalities. When they looked at uh, blood pressure goals, there was a little bit of a difference. Um, and if they looked at whether or not people were using different antihypertensive medications, there, there was a slight difference, but really not significant. Um, and if they looked at uh, patients who had diabetes, 
um, compared to whites. Um, they showed that uh, black patients who had a low risk of apolipoprotein had a faster progression, but those who had two of the genetic variants had the fastest progression compared to, to whites. And they looked at those patients without diabetes and found the same thing. Whites were here, um, black patients who had either none or one of the risk factors or the polymorphisms had faster progression, but then blacks who had both of the polymorphisms had the fastest progression. And this is a study from the atherosclerosis risk um, uh, cohort, and it shows that participants who had either zero or one of the apolipoprotein risk allele had this faster progression compared to those who had two alleles. So these are new data that are coming out, and they are all showing that for patients who have two of these risk alleles, they really have either increased uh, progression of uh, chronic kidney disease, they have in, increased end-stage renal disease, and there are some studies that show that it's also associated with cardiovascular disease. So this is a, a recent study that's actually in press um, that I received uh, from Dr. Himmelfarb. Um, and it shows that uh, kidneys um, from donors with uh, the apolipoprotein genotypes have shorter survival. So if um, sub they looked at subjects from Alabama and I think Wake Forest, and they compared the people who received kidneys from uh, subjects who were apolipoprotein, um, e either had one or two variants of apolipoprotein, and they showed that uh, there was a faster uh, progression and faster um, sort of or less allograft survival. So these kidneys rejected um, and people lost their kidney um, faster if they had two of the risk alleles. Um, so transplanted kidneys can last anywhere from 10 to 20 years, depending on how they're matched. Um, but this showed that some people were losing their kidneys much faster, um, and it's probably within five to six years. Um, so, and, and they looked at whether or not African Americans progressed just on their own, and, and African Americans progressed faster, but not as fast as those who had the two risk alleles. So um, just in summary, these data so, sort of show that this is a new genetic um, polymorphism that's associated with increased risk of end-stage renal disease and now increased risk of progression and shorter uh, lifespan of transplanted kidneys. Um, and so what, what we don't know, though, is that whether or not, um, you know, everyone who has the, this abnormality, whether or not they progress to end-stage renal disease and what factors actually are effective, um, and whether or not there are interventions that can actually decrease the risk of survival. So there are a lot of questions that um, have not been answered. Um, so we, we will go now to sickle cell trait, which is sort of a newer um, uh, genetic abnormality that's been associated with chronic kidney disease. So sickle cell trait, as you all know, um, means that uh, people inherit a single copy of the hemoglobin gene and it affects one in 12 African Americans, but it also affects people from uh, worldwide, and it's estimated that over 300 million people are affected, um, either from the Caribbean or from the Mediterranean. Uh, sickle cell disease is well known to be associated with kidney disease. Um, it's associated with decreased urinary concentrating ability, chronic kidney disease, and development of end-stage renal disease. But up to this point, less have been known about sickle cell trait and the association with kidney disease. Um, and this is the sickle cell here, um, and, and it's uh, protective against malaria, again. So what are the genetics? So if you have someone who has sickle cell trait and they marry or they, um, they have children with someone who has no uh, trait, then 50% the of the children are at risk for sickle cell trait. Um, or you can have um, two people who have sickle cell trait, and, and they are at risk for having one child who has sickle cell disease and children who have sickle cell trait or, or a child that does not have trait of sickle cell trait at all. So we hypothesized that sickle cell trait was associated with the development of chronic kidney disease. Um, and as a part of my work with the Jackson Heart Study, we were fortunate to be involved in this study. Um, and this study combined data from five population-based cohorts, including the atherosclerosis risk in community study, or the ERIC study, uh, which enrolled patients from 1987 to 2013, the Jackson Heart Study, which uh, we des I've described, the Coronary Artery Risk de Development in Young Adults Study, or the CARDIA Study, and the Multi-Ethnic Study of Atherosclerosis, or the MESA Study, from basically 2000 to 2012, and the Women's Health Initiative from 1993 to 2012. So all these sources were combined, 
The primary outcome was chronic kidney disease, which was defined as the estimated GFR of less than 60 mils per minute um, at baseline or at follow-up. And we looked at prevalent chronic kidney disease, incident kidney disease, albuminuria, and decline in eGFR of greater than three mils per minute per meter squared per year. Um, the methods included logistic regression, and models were adjusted for age, sex, clinic, African genetic ancestry, and diabetes. And a meta-analysis was used to sort of combine all the cohorts to get the final outcome. So when we looked at the association of sickle cell trait with prevalent chronic kidney disease, there was a 1.57 um, increased risk of prevalent chronic kidney disease. And just from the patients from the Jackson Heart Study, that risk was about twofold higher. Um, when we looked at the association of sickle cell trait with EGFR decline, there was about a, um, a 1.32 greater risk of EGFR decline in subjects who had sickle cell trait compared to those without. And in Jackson Heart um, study, it was about 1.28, and, and that wasn't statistically significant. Um, and for the association of sickle cell trait with chronic kidney disease, incident chronic kidney disease, or the development of an EGFR less than 60, um, it was about uh, 1.79-fold, uh, so 79% greater risk of development of in incident chronic kidney disease in patients with sickle cell trait. Um, and for Jackson Heart, that value was about 2.3-fold. So this is sort of the overall um, odds of someone developing incident chronic kidney disease comparing and sort of combining all of the cohorts. Um, so. What this study showed is, was that sickle cell trait is associated with prevalent chronic kidney disease and incident chronic kidney disease and EGFR decline and albuminuria in about 15, in a pooled cohort, cohort of 15,000 um, African Americans. And sickle cell trait, um, we think, probably explains a portion of the differences in chronic kidney disease to comparing African Americans to whites, but probably not all of the risk. And I think that further research is, is still needed to determine whether or not targeted interventions um, to some of the other risk factors that we know may, dec that may decrease incidence and progression of chronic kidney disease. Um, so some of the conclusions from this are that kidney disease um, progression in African Americans is heterogeneous and that not everybody progresses at the same rate. And the risk factors that we know, such as hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and um, the social, social demographic factors are all risk factors that can increase risk for kidney disease. And you know, possibly there's a, a two-hit model where someone has some underlying genetic abnormality um, and they have hypertension or diabetes or these other risk factors and that may account for a more rapid progression to kidney disease. Um, in the Jackson Heart Study, we found that obesity was less of a risk factor for kidney disease. Um, and that and we know that genetic abnormalities now contribute to kidney disease uh, differences, and those include sickle cell trait and the ApoL1 genetic polymorphism. Um, so we'll, we're going to go back to policy making um, for the sort of remainder of the talk here. Um, and I'm going to show a picture. And can, does anyone know what this picture is from? Uh, let's see. Let's keep you right, right. So it's a color photograph. Usually we see the black and white photograph. And Tuskegee um, was basically um, a study, uh, an observational study where um, about 400 or so African American men who had syphilis were enrolled in this study. They thought that they were being treated for syphilis um, and they were followed basically for their lifetime. Um, and even when there was a, a drug available for syphilis, penicillin, when it became available, these, these patients were not treated, um, and they were just followed. They thought they were being treated. Um, they were getting blood draws. They would get LPs, um, and then they were followed until they died. And the study actually went on until, like, the, the early 70s until it was actually stopped. So this legacy of the Tuskegee study um, is prob probably underpins the mistrust in the African-American community for um, the, sort of interacting with the, the medical um, institutions. Um, there are other things, though, that contribute to sort of mistrust in African Americans. So the sickle cell testing program that was developed probably in the 70s um, was associated with mistrust because people felt like they were being labeled with sickle cell disease. So um, once people actually had a diagnosis of sickle cell disease, they may not have been able to get insurance. Um, if they wanted to play sports, they may not have been allowed to. So, um, and then 
uh, people were supposed to tell their partners that they had sickle cell disease, and so some of that probably didn't happen. Um, so we have some issues with genetic screening and uh, telling people their results. Um, and for kidneys, uh, sort of for the nephrology community, we have the polycystic kidney disease um, patients where I think when I was a fellow, um, we had a policy of don't ask, don't tell. So we would know that people have polycystic kidney disease, but we would actually tell them to not have their children evaluated for polycystic kidney disease because we knew that they would not be able to get insurance because they would have a pre-existing kidney disease. So um, hopefully now with Obamacare, that's not going to be the case, but um, there is this sort of legacy of concerns of actually making diagnoses and how that affects healthcare. Um, so what is the right way to do genetic testing? Um, should we screen every, all African Americans for ApoL1 and sickle cell trait? Um, and who, once we get that information, who's going to have access to it? How long should that information be kept and who keeps it? And if we find out that someone actually has a disease that we thought was uh, actually benign like sickle cell trait, um, what should we do with that information and how do we tell people um, sort of new information? So this gets to a grant that we wrote that we you know, hopefully will have funded where we're going to be doing a community-based evaluation of ApoL1 genetic testing in African Americans. We'll, we will be conducting key informant interviews to determine views about ApoL1 for research participants and testing. We'll be conducting community-based deliberative groups to identify community preferences and priorities for responsible approaches to ApoL1 testing. Um, that can probably be extended to other genetic um, testing and abnormalities. And then we'll probably convene a national meeting of stakeholders to review the current science um, and develop guidelines. And so we're going to be doing this work with Wiley Burke, um, Malia Fullerton, Erica Blackshear, Clarence Bigner, and Jonathan Himmelfarb. Um, so um, I think my, my view of the determinants of health and kidney disease um, sort of stem from individual health and includes all of these uh, sort of five things like policy and social factors and health services. Um, individual health behavior plays a role in biology and genetics it certainly play a role. But I think my, my idea of the determinant, uh, determinants of health have now changed where we, we need to focus in on the individual and their health and then uh, really sort of look at all these other factors and, and just really concentrate on the individual. But know that these risk factors are out there and give people tools to, to help um, prevent um, kidney disease and, and other poor outcomes like um, death and cardiovascular disease. Um, so in conclusion, um, I'd say that chronic kidney disease in African Americans is heterogeneous and we need to know that some people progress faster. Um, we know that there are differences in traditional risk factors and some novel risk factors. Um, we have these new genetic abnormalities that I think are going to change the way that we evaluate African Americans for their kidney disease. And people are already doing genetic testing for ApoL1, um, but I think the ethics of the testing and how we give people information hasn't really been evaluated. Um, and we'll have to develop new paradigms for genetic testing and delivering results if needed. Um, so I want to thank the Jackson Heart Working Group um, and the people at uh, the Kidney Research Institute and the University of Washington, and including Jonathan Himmelfarb and Ronit Pat, who's done a lot of the an analyses, Brian Kestenbaum and Ian DeBoer, um, and um, at uh, the UW Genetics Vanguard Center, um, Alex Reiner, who has been a big help with uh, the sickle cell disease um, analyses. And um, I want to sort of thank um, the Division of Nephrology, Stuart, uh, for, for support and uh, my funding, the Kidney Research Institute and the VA, uh, Rudy Rodriguez, for their support. Um, and I received funding from um, the National Institutes of uh, Health, the NIDBK, and the VA. Um, and uh, thank you, and I'll take questions. And I just want to say one more thing. So I just want to really thank the residents um, and the services, uh, because I had a, recently I had an uncle who passed away at the VA. And I just want to say that I really appreciate all the care that everyone gave him. So thank you very much. Thank you.
especially for a tremendous talk. Uh, hypertension, as you uh, told us, is a major risk factor for the development of kidney disease and the progression of kidney disease in the, the demographics that you spoke of. Should we be redefining what is a normal blood pressure in minorities, rather than using the standard definitions that we currently use? I, thanks for the question, Stuart. I think that's a great question, and I think that given the information from the ASK study that showed that there was progression no matter whether or not the blood pressure was adequately controlled, we may have to develop new guidelines for treatment and maybe one size doesn't fit all. Um, and I think that's something that we can look at um, statistically going through, you know, the randomized controlled trials and some of the observational cohorts that we have. Um, but I, I think that we, we may need to look at what level of blood pressure causes the, the least risk in, in this population. Thanks for the great talk, Bessie. Um, I'm interested in thinking about how um, racially discordant relationships between patients and uh, providers impact their health outcomes, and especially at the VA uh, where I practice, we have zero African-American providers in primary care and a large African-American population of patients, and it's really interesting to see, to me, how those relationships play out, and, and I'm wondering if it has been looked at how outcomes might be different in uh, racially concordant relationships between providers and patients and what we can do to improve some of that. Right, I think there, there are some data that look at sort of racial concordance and whether or not there's trust and um, whether or not patients feel comfortable with those providers. And I think that there, there are data that show that that is true. But I, I think that in terms of actual outcomes, um, if people have a good relationship with their patients, I think that whether or not they're, they are race or um, sort of concordant, that, that, that has less to do with sort of um, listening to patients and making sure that they're well educated and making sure that it's sort of like more of a shared decision making process in terms of what what they do and what medications they take and and really I think de determining whether or not you know people have at the VA we are lucky so that uh, you know patients don't have to pay a lot for their medications um, but other places where patients have to pay a lot they may not have the money to pay for their medications and so actually asking pe pe people about whether or not they have funds to, to pay for medications or, or who helps them and, and those sorts of things I think will be beneficial. Um, so thanks for the question. Yeah. Thank you very, very for a very interesting talk. There's some conflicting data about ApoL1 being associated with lupus nephritis. And I'm wondering whether you think that this polymorphism is a more generalized uh, risk for progression of renal disease, or is it linked to hypertension in patients with, with other diseases? Where do you think that fits in, and how can you help us sort that out? Right, so, um, so I think, so the, the, the initial studies actually showed, and there, there has been a lot of confusion and sort of conflicting studies, and the initial studies showed that the ApoL1 um, polymorphisms were really linked to hypertensive end-stage renal disease, um, and they've also been linked to um, high VAN or HIV-associated kidney disease. I think, I, I personally think, but don't have data to sort of support it, is that it's probably a risk factor, but you have to have sort of like other risk factors that play into this. So, you know, people who may have hypertension or diabetes or other risk factors are more at risk for progression of kidney disease. But just because you have that abnormality doesn't mean that you're actually necessarily going to get kidney disease if you, you know, eat, eat a healthy diet and don't drink alcohol and don't smoke and those sorts of things. So it, it may be... Uh, it, it may be an underlying risk factor, but um, has to combine with other things that may cause increased progression. Um, and I think that there's a lot of data that are, is still being looked at. Um, and so it, the, the ABLE-L1 story may change because initially that ABLE-L1 story was, was associated with MHY9, um, which is in the, on the same chromosome. Uh, so this, this more recent paper actually shows that the, the linkage was more associated with ApoL1 and the polymorphisms there. So I think things are, are not quite settled. Thank you for that talk, Dr. Young. I was particularly intrigued by this relationship between trypanosomiasis and ApoL1. And as I understand, uh, a different species of trypanosomes cause Chagas disease in Central and South America. Is there any association between Trypanosome cruzi and chronic kidney disease or ApoL1? 
So that, I, I actually don't know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, but I will look it up. But uh, there, there is, so there, there are like three, at least two or three different trypanosomes in Africa. And it's really with um, sort of one of the two trypanosomes that this relationship with ApoL1 and kidney disease has been found. So that's a good question. Um, and maybe it might be important. And that's a good uh, avenue that probably should be looked at. Because um, again, it's not really clear what the mechanism is in terms of why that polymorphism is associated with development of kidney disease. And I think so a lot of things have to be evaluated and determined in terms of a mechanism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.